So um, when philosophers ask the question, what makes art good? They ask that in a particularly philosophical register. So I thought we could do a little ooh-ah presentation <laughs> of some artworks that I think you, said you would agree are quite good. Here's something from, uh, there you go. Um, here's something from yep, Turner. Beautiful, right? Here's something from Mancusi. Very good, Bird in Space. Here's something from. <laughs> <laughs> I like the close ups because uh, you can really see the artistry in it, the beauty of, of the work. Um, look at that. So we have some sculpture, we have some paintings. Some dance. You can just keep watching that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and of course, here's sheet music for Schubert's 21st piano sonata, Mine, um, which is very beautiful if you don't know. Dun, 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 dun. That one. So, what makes an artwork good? I think you just saw some good artwork. In some ways, the answer to that question is obvious. Lots of things make artworks good. Financial value. Some artworks are just worth money. That's good. Right? You could sell it and get money from it. That makes it kind of good in virtue of its financial value. Some of them have social value. If you own the work, that means you have some kind of social prestige. Um, or if you like a certain band, that gives you some kind of cultural capital. Some of them are decoratively good. Uh, some paintings match your couch. And you can put them next to your couch and make your living room look nice. Some of them have instrumental value. Ever use a little sculpture as a paperweight? That's useful. Some of them have therapeutic value. Listen to that Schubert. Sonata, and tell me you don't just feel a little better. <laughs> you will. Um, some of them have cognitive value. They give us knowledge about the world. A lot of people think novels do this for us. They tell us about how human beings feel or how to respond to certain moral situations. They have expressive value. They allow us to express our feelings or our thoughts. And so on, ethical, communicative, and of course, aesthetic value. Some artworks are good because they're beautiful. They have aesthetic value. So the question that philosophers ask is not what makes art good, but what makes art good as art, like distinctively good as art. I submit that um, da Vinci's paintings, which sell for $450 million, um, that price tag doesn't make the painting good as art. It makes it good as an investment or good as a market commodity. So we ask, what makes an artwork good? in particular as art. And I think we can rule some things out, like financial, instrumental, and social. But questions arise as to other things, like what about cognitive value, ethical value, expressive value, communicative value in some sense? Do those make artworks good as art? So here's a proposal that has had a lot of, um, a lot of ink has been spilled over this idea in the history of philosophy of art which is the aesthetic theory of art. So what makes an artwork good as art is its aesthetic value. So what makes an artwork good as art is the fact that it's beautiful in some sense. And um, some people think that this just follows from a certain theory of art, a theory of art that says artworks, well, what are they? They're human-made artifacts that are designed to give us experiences of beauty. So artworks are designed to give us experiences of beauty. If something is designed well as an artwork, it's good. What makes it good? Well, it gives you an experience of beauty. So what makes art good is its aesthetic value. Now, um, of course, that just raises the question, what is aesthetic value? And the answer to that is not obvious. Um, this is probably the central question in the philosophy of art and aesthetics um, in the last several hundred years. 
And we're still discussing it. I was at a seminar in Vancouver for three weeks this summer. This was the central question of the seminar. Um, work is, is still being done on this. But um, it's important to notice when you ask this question that there are really two questions here. When we're asking what is aesthetic value, we could be asking the demarcation question, which is what makes an aesthetic value aesthetic? So there's a range of aesthetic properties that you might um, consider when you're wondering about something's aesthetic value. Grace, elegance, smoothness, purity, clarity, warmth, light. These are the kinds of things that critics note when they talk about the value of art. What makes those aesthetic and other ones not? You might think elegance is clearly an aesthetic property, but what about angularity or bulkiness or flatness? Seems like maybe they could be aesthetically good in some sense, but they don't resonate as aesthetic properties quite as clearly. So that's the demarcation question. What makes an aesthetic property aesthetic? Normative question is, what makes an aesthetic value value? Values give us reasons, right? Values give us reasons to do things. What makes an aesthetic value such that it gives you reason to do something? That is to say, it gives you reason to look at it, to appreciate it, to share it with friends, to be inspired by it to do your own creative work, and so on. That's the value question and the normative question. Now, there's a classic answer to both of those questions. And it's that classic answer we call the default theory of aesthetic value. And that's just the combination of the view called formalism with a view called hedonism. So in answer to the demarcation question, philosophers say, some philosophers say, well, what makes a value, what makes aesthetic value aesthetic is the way it arises from form. And we think of form in terms of various um, basic properties like shape, tone, color, and line. I like to look at the Brancusi in this respect. That's beautiful. Um, I think you can't argue with that claim. It's beautiful. What makes it beautiful? Well, obviously it has something to do with the color, the shape, the, mo the, the movement, the geometrical properties of the line. It's form, in other words. Now, um, <clears throat> what makes that beauty such that we ought to look at it? What makes it a value? Hedonism says that what makes aesthetic value valuable is pleasure. It's nice to look at that thing. And it's being pleasing is what grounds the various actions we might take in response to it. That's what makes aesthetic value a value. So here's the Bancusi. I just went through that. <clears throat> Formalism says um, that it's the form of that that makes it aesthetic. And hedonism says that it's the pleasure that you get when you look at it that makes it a value. So. Um, you might look at the, this, this can apply across the arts, not just sculpture, but to painting, to dance, to poetry, and so on. What makes an aesthetic value aesthetic is the way it rises from form. We look at the form that her body takes, not just the static form when she's in a pose, but the dynamic form, the way she moves through space. And then, of course, it's the pleasure that you get in sort of beholding the forms that she's making and doing in her action um, <coughs> that, uh, give this, uh, this dance uh, aesthetic value. So um, the problem is, as compelling as that my theory, sorry, as compelling as that theory might sound, uh, it's widely rejected. And I think it's widely rejected for good reasons. So um, the problem is that there are numerous examples of artworks that lack this default aesthetic value. So while the default theory might capture some artworks, it certainly doesn't capture all of them. So here's an artwork. Um, this is a, a, an almost cliche example at this point in, in rejecting the, the default theory. But Marcel Duchamp put this toilet in a gallery and called it art. And um, it's widely regarded as um, uh, one of the most formative and central pieces of anti-aesthetic art. 
artworks that seem good as art, but which seem to lack aesthetic value. Now, porcelain is pretty, right? But, and so there's a sense in which the fountain has some aesthetic value. It's nice to look at porcelain. Lots of sculptures are made out of porcelain. <laughs> but um, that's not what makes it good as art. What makes it good as art is something else about what Duchamp was doing when he put this in a gallery. Um, I'll just give you one more example um, from Adrian Piper, a very different example. Adrian Piper is a, a wonderful philosopher. She has a PhD in philosophy. And uh, probably, I would say, the most, if, if one of the most important conceptual artists, the foundational artist in the invention of conceptual art, um, at who's, who's uh, alive and well and working and just had a MoMA retrospective last uh, this year, first half of this year. Piper, one of Piper's works is called My Calling Card, number one. Piper's a light-skinned black woman, and she's often um, confused as being white at parties. And so people around her would start telling racist jokes as if she was in on this kind of racist camaraderie among white people. She tried, obviously, um, she wouldn't stand for this, and, um, but it was a consistent problem in her social life. And so she would, um, initially she tried to tell people beforehand that she, um, that she wouldn't accept these kinds of jokes, she, she was a black woman, but um, she found that that was socially unacceptable. People would ostracize her or criticize her or get defensive. And so as a, as a new strategy, she invented these cards. They're just a bis the size of about, about the size of a business card. And if someone made a racist joke or a comment or laughed at a racist joke, she would just hand them this card. Um, the thought being that uh, this was a, a kind of artistic way to intervene in the social dynamics. Um, and sort of by her telling, um, to spark a transformative experience or a transformation in the people who were so comfortable with racist camaraderie in the hopes that um, they would uh, lower their defenses and be more open to rejecting that kind of interaction and being more accepting of people like Piper. So um, the first point there is just from the Duchamp and the Piper, there are numerous examples of artworks that lack aesthetic value, <coughs> but are nonetheless good as art. I submit that Piper's work is good as art, but it's hard to see where the formalist aesthetic value is. In fact, it's hard to even see where the pleasure is. It seems like pleasure is not really involved in, in that equation. And there are lots of other examples like horror films and things like that. But also, the aesthetic theory makes for bad advice. We shouldn't go around telling artists that they should focus their efforts on making beautiful artworks. Um, it may be that they should focus some of their efforts on, on that in terms of uh, just training and, and artistic technique, but it's certainly not the only thing that an artist can do to make great artwork. So um, that motivates a slightly different way of thinking about what makes an artwork good as such or as art. And a pluralist answer is that lots of things do. And it's really up to us to do sound and careful art criticism in art history to look at individual works and to talk about what makes those works good as art. And as we know from the history of art, we might be surprised. Right? The thing that might make it good uh, could be something quite original and unique in the history of art. This is another way of saying, um, somewhat provocatively here at the bottom, nothing makes art good. In other words, no kind of thing does. Artistic value is just an umbrella term for lots of different kinds of things, ethical, cognitive, moral, aesthetic, communicative, expressive, originality, whatever, that might make a work good as art. So um, to give you a sense of the kinds of things that might make a work of art good as art, um, here's art historian Grant Kester's take on some of Adrian Piper's work. He says, when we encounter new experiences, we undergo a transformation only to gradually recohere around this transformed identity in anticipation of encounters yet to come. The extent to which we're willing to allow these experiences to touch us and to reconfigure our subsequent interactions with others varies from person to person, 
Piper's performances and installations provide a mise-en-scene designed to encourage such transformations. So Kester's thought is that one of the things that makes Piper's work good as art is this transformative character. And that could just be another thing that the pluralist acknowledges as a good art-making feature, among many others. So that's not the end of the story, though, because uh, we still face this question of what constrains uh, artistic value. It seems like we can't st say yet that like anything goes. A plausible pluralism about um, artistic value has to exclude some things, like financial value, for example. So what principle constrains pluralism? That's a really important philosophical question. And it's an open question in aesthetics. <laughs> People are still working on this. Um, it's hard to, it, it's a little hard to find a kind of general answer to this question. But what we can do is make some progress on more specific answers to the question. Like, for example, what's the relationship between aesthetic or artistic value and moral value? You might think that some works, as many people have plausibly thought, some works are good because of their ethical character. They, in some sense, uh, express positive ethical views or make us more ethical as people. <clears throat> so we could ask these questions. If a work is morally good, is it thereby, and to that extent, artistically good? Or if a work is morally bad, is it thereby, and to that extent, artistically bad? Now, those are, in terms of standards of philosophy, extraordinarily imprecise questions. <laughs> and you have to do a lot of work to clarify the question and to give a proper answer to it. But I want to give you a sense of how we might answer these questions by looking at one painting, um, although this is nowhere near the, the sort of exemplary of the range of issues that come up with respect to this question. Consider Titian's Rape of Europa. Philosopher A.W. Eaton argues that this is an immoral work and that it's in virtue of its immorality that it lacks aesthetic value. That goes against the grain of art history. This is widely regarded by many art historians anyway as, um, I don't know what the consensus is these days, but um, throughout history certainly it's been uh, revered as a great painting. But Eaton argues that this painting eroticizes rape. And I think if you know about the story of the rape of Europa and the way that this is depicted, looking at the cupids, the dress, uh, the stance of Europa on the bull, um, you might agree that it eroticizes rape. Now, eroticizing rape is wrong. It's morally wrong. And so insofar, as this work prescribes the response associated with eroticizing rape, it prescribes an immoral response. Insofar as this work asks you to say, look at rape with an erotic perspective. Insofar as it asks you to do that, it prescribes that response. It's an immoral work. And that's what Eaton argues. And so the argument, the second step of that argument is that this makes it aesthetically bad, because it asks you to have a response that you should not have. And so you cannot, the artist has made a defective work, prescribing responses it's wrong to have. The argument goes something like this, the merited response argument. Artworks prescribe responses. So this is a common thought. What artworks do for us, in part, it's the job of the artist, to create an object that says, hey, you know, respond in this way to this work. And the works are often designed to get you to have a certain experience or have a certain response, whether that's pleasure or horror or um, you know, the ooh-ah sensation we all had together earlier. Um, artworks tell us how to feel, as it were. They prescribe responses. And a work is good. Here's a, here's a necessary condition on a work's being good. It's good only if the responses it prescribes are merited by the work. A work is bad if it prescribes a response that you just shouldn't have. Right? Or if it 
prescribes a response that the work itself doesn't support. Immoral responses are not merited, should not have moral, immoral responses. Um, therefore, if an artwork prescribes an immoral response, then it prescribes an unmerited response. And therefore, any such work is not good as art. This is a version of what we might call moralism, which says that artworks are aesthetically good insofar as um, they're moral and aesthetically bad insofar as they're immoral. So it's one way of answering part of the pluralist challenge, which is to give a principled distinction between values that can figure in artistic value and those that cannot by way of answering the question of what makes a work of art good. That's just the tip of a very interesting iceberg that <coughs> philosophers of art are currently discussing. Um, and so um, that's all I have to say about that. Thank you. So apart from a small print collection, a few paintings made by elephants, and innumerable objects that never aspired to be more than decorative, I own only a single work that might be called real art. So I brought it here today, thinking it might help set the tone for my discussion. be good art? It is a tacky representation of, of an obscene gesture. No skill was required in its construction. It is simply a cast of the artist's hand. Yet I could make the claim that it is good in several respects. I can make a straightforward claim that it is good in the moral sense of the word because the piece was made to raise money for a charity, the Public Art Fund in New York City. But moral goodness is not usually what we mean when we ask whether something is good art. The possibility that this work of art might be good is not reducible to the fact that it was made by a prestigious contemporary artist, Ai Weiwei. However, the identity of the artist is a relevant factor because attaching his name immediately positions this piece within the context of the artist's overall body of work. That positioning provides this piece with a deep and layered network of associations. If it was just the hand of some random guy, I'm sure it would annoy me as much as it is annoying some of you right now. But when we recognize the hand of Ai Weiwei, the gesture situates the work in counterpoint to Ai's series of photographs titled Study of Perspective. The fact that this is a cast of the artist's hand further connects it with these photographs. Like the photographs, it is an iconic trace of the artist's body, a self-portrait, no less than if it were an image of his face. But it also becomes a mobile prop with which one can replicate the action in the photographs, aiming the gesture at anything one wishes to critique. I have it set up to face my front door at home, and somehow it never fails to amuse me to be greeted by Ai Weiwei flipping me the bird when I get home after a long day of pontificating about art history. <laughs> but is it good art? I won't try to convince you that it is beautiful, because I do not believe that beauty is the tactic through which this piece does its work. It is not a beautiful hand. It is not a beautiful gesture. It is simply a cast, so there is no beautiful craftsmanship to admire. I want to argue instead that the question of beauty is not even at stake here. It was not a quality to which the artist aspired with this work. Concerns for beauty and skill appear equally irrelevant in the corresponding photographs, snapshots taken with deliberate lack of concern for composition or clarity. Can ugly art, clumsy art, art made deliberately without skill, still be considered good? In common with what I suspect would be the majority of today's art historians, I don't particularly care if art is beautiful, in the same way that it matters little to me whether or not my friends are beautiful. I got the impression that some people who attended last semester's series on beauty were disconcerted to discover that my colleagues from the art department were those who appeared the least enthusiastic about the idea of beauty. 
I think that's because when you really get to know art, the beauty of a work begins to seem no more important than the beauty of one's friends. It's nice to have beautiful friends, but it would be shallow to insist on it. Even an ugly work of art, once you get to know it, can turn out to have a great personality. I would propose rather that knowledge, your knowledge, is what makes a work of art good, in the same way that friendship deepens the better you get to know someone, or the way that historical questions become more intriguing the more deeply you explore them. I have to pause here to acknowledge my own bias. Professor inserts the importance of knowledge is not exactly an innovative or revelatory position. The fact is, I don't think that there can be an unbiased answer to the question of what makes art good, though that is not quite the same thing of saying that the matter is entirely relative. Rather, this is a question that is continually being renegotiated on the basis of shifting cultural priorities, much like the artistic canon itself. My perspective is naturally that of an educator and a historian. A good work of art, from my point of view, is one that best illuminates distinctive features of its era and cultural context, and continues to be engaging and relevant for later generations, even if they end up understanding it very differently from those who first made and viewed it. But I recognize that this is not the only and absolute answer to the question, just one set of lenses that we can look through. Put on a different pair of glasses, and you will find yourself evaluating art with another set of standards. I have long had an arch enemy of sorts, a man named Clive Bell, who published a book in 1914 that begins with a chapter entitled The Aesthetic Hypothesis. I first read this chapter in grad school and was immediately outraged. And every time I read it since, I gnash my teeth, I shake my fist, and mutter imprecations at a man long dead. This happened again just last night. <laughs> <laughs> my problem with Bell is that he appears indifferent to the history of art, to the specific iconology, the complex and necessarily unique nuances that color each work with meaning. Did I say Bell appears indifferent? No, he explicitly says as much. Quoting, he who can feel the profound significance of form is raised above the accidents of time and place. To him, the problems of archaeology, history, and hagiography are impertinent. If the forms of a work are significant, its provenance is irrelevant. Them's fighting words to an art historian. <laughs> But Clive Bell's only concern was for whether the form of work gave him a certain kind of feeling, a little frisson of exhilaration, aesthetic ecstasy or exultation. He would look at a work and decide instantly if it was good based on his, quote, personal experience of a peculiar emotion, what he termed the aesthetic emotion, which he asserted was aroused by significant form. But would Clive Bell think my little sculpture is good? Alas, we'll never know because he died in 1964. And that is one drawback of Bell's method. He solved the problem of relativism by positing a priestly high caste, insisting that he was one of a chosen few born with aesthetic judgment that was infallible. Thus, he could act as intercessor between art and the insensate public. That's us. Without the guidance of someone blessed with his peculiar sensibility, we dullards have no method of determining what art is good. For me, a good work of art is akin to a book, a story to be studied slowly and over time with growing appreciation. For Bell, it is more like a flower, a form to be admired in a single moment of rapture, even if its name is unknown. The contrast reminds me of a line from Gerard Manley Hopkins, whether at once, as once at a crash pall, or as Austin, a lingering out sweet skill. Though he was describing two kinds of spiritual conversion, it could apply as readily to our encounters with art. And while I will confess that part of my resentment of Bell stems from the recognition that I am apparently one of those obtuse individuals who neither seeks nor obtains emotional satisfaction from art, I will acknowledge that perhaps these two approaches are not incompatible. There is no reason that one could not study a work of art and also be emotionally moved by it if one were of both dispositions. 
As a historian, I have to pause to observe that it is surely no accident that formalism of the sort that Clive Bell championed emerged right around the time that the West was first seriously confronted by an influx of material culture, much of which was readily embraced as art from other parts of the world. Works from Mesoamerica, Asia, Africa, the Pacific Islands, diverse and disparate civilizations from the far corners of the globe were all lumped together by Western artists and critics of the time as primitivism. And far from scorning these things, critics like Bell concluded that, quote, as a rule, primitive art is good on the basis of its purely formal characteristics. To truly understand the meaning and significance of any of these works would have required years of study of each of the relevant cultures. But in Bell's era, the first half of the 20th century, so-called primitive art was far more abundant than the academic resources that would have been required to properly understand it. So a new method was needed to assess its quality. If one were feeling uncharitable, one might propose that Bell's formalism elevates superficiality itself into art criticism. My approach as an art historian is effectively the opposite of Bell's, but it is not without its own drawbacks. I propose that no single person can make conclusive judgments about the quality of a work of art, nor can its quality be fully assessed at any single moment. Instead, we collectively determine what art is good over the course of time through an ongoing process of discussion and evaluation, which results in an ever-evolving canon. I may declare that I am unimpressed by the Mona Lisa, but I acknowledge that I have been overruled by the general consensus perhaps with one exception. <laughs> and I think for all the rudeness of the gesture, the deliberate ineptness of the photograph, Ai Weiwei is making an important point here. Though I just stated that I find value in canonicity, I do worry when it becomes unreflective. It disturbs me that the Mona Lisa has become a reflexive synecdoche for good art. In our era of proliferating images, where an icon is no longer a sacred image to be kissed, but a little picture on a screen that we prod or click in the course of work or play, the Mona Lisa is so commonly reproduced, so frequently extolled, that her face has become a mask of itself. Her glamour blinds us to her actuality. The Mona Lisa is a victim of her own celebrity. Like a movie star, her image is taken on a life of its own independent of the individual underneath. Like a movie star, when we meet the Mona Lisa in real life, she is smaller than we expected, underwhelming, maybe even a bit ordinary. If we look even more closely, trying to perceive what it was that we sought in her glamour, do we understand her any better? I'm not sure. Many have concluded that the Mona Lisa is a cipher, and then they celebrate this very indecipherability. But I suspect that the so-called mystery of the Mona Lisa's smile is nothing more than a product of our anxiety to interpret it, like a word that you say too many times in a row until it unmakes itself and stops making sense. The Mona Lisa is a painting that is famous for being famous. And how did she get so famous in the first place? On the basis of her formal quality? In part, perhaps. But she was also a victim of a series of bizarre events in the early 20th century. A celebrity stalker's obsession, a kidnapping. And there's nothing like a little drama to capture the attention of the public. In time, these events were largely forgotten. The painting was found and returned to the Louvre, but the fame they inspired has lingered. Does this make the Mona Lisa a good painting? From an aesthetic standpoint, I have no idea, not being Clive Bell, but the Mona Lisa's history is fascinating, and the work is the surviving material embodiment of that history. As works of art age, they acquire the aura of relics, activating our imagination of the stories we were taught about their origins. Certainly, one of the big lessons of art history, at least for the last few centuries, is the curious equation by which controversiality can be transmuted into canonicity. 
Take Edouard Manet, an artist who is most certainly not among the most skillful painters of his generation, but who was a genius at stirring up publicity and scandal. Visually, the very awkwardness of Manet's works having given them an enduring capacity to intrigue. Take Manet's notorious bar at the Folie Bergère. Countless wild theories have been proposed to try to make sense of the irreconcilable reflection. What is going on in the background? It doesn't seem to be visually congruent with the foreground. Who is that guy? Why don't the angles of the reflection align? What does it all mean? Then in 2001, an enterprising grad student reconstructed the scene and found a way it could make legible visual sense after all, without the interference of wandering ghosts or erotic desires or resurfacing memories. There is something satisfying in a concrete answer like that, and also something flat and disappointing. And now that so many other hypotheses have already been proposed, the reductive optical solution is just one answer among many, one that most scholars, already committed to the idea of the work as the exteriorized expression of some interior idea, would probably resist. All of these arguments have become aspects of the wider resonance of the piece. Is it a good work of art? I don't know, but it makes for good conversation. Let me take another tack, one that tries to explain not only why Manet's Bar at the Folie Bergère is seen as important precisely to the degree that it resists reductive interpretation, but how this idea became the basis for much contemporary art today. I'm going to go out on a limb here. Bernard Faure, a French Buddhist studies scholar, published a critique of Zen in the late 20th century that raised the possibility that the process of being certified as a Zen master and some lineages uh, do offer you a literal certificate when you finish the program, was perhaps less about ineffable spiritual attainment, a mind-to-mind -mind transmission of the Dharma, as the brochures might suggest, than a process of mastering a specific rhetorical mode. And some might say the same thing about academia. <laughs> I, suspect good, uh, I suspect contemporary art might not be so different from the paradoxes promoted by Zen. A good work of contemporary art functions not unlike a Zen koan, creating a problem that cannot be resolved through conventional thinking. If a work does not present us with such a problem, then we tend to regard it as merely an act of descriptive narrative or a decorative object, or an instrumental image like those used in advertising. None of the latter things are considered particularly good by the standards of contemporary art, at least when taken on their own, serving their usual purposes. They can be recontextualized into art, of course, like Warhol's Brillo boxes, but they acquire significance in their new context precisely when they stop making sense in their old one acquiring the inexplicability of a koan. Furthermore, I suspect it is not a coincidence that this new rhetoric of contemporary art began to take root at precisely the historical moment that the hipsters in mid-20th century America became captivated by Zen, and Clive Bell started to seem a bit square. Ai Weiwei's little sculpture does present us with such a problem a Gordian knot of contradictions, the problem of its own being, an insouciant object, undeniably tacky, mimesis unelevated by any display of technical skill, unapologetically defiant and rude. Yet it has the aura of art in its pretentious lack of practical utility, the cachet of a famous and fashionable name. Being not merely a work by Ai Weiwei, but a model of the own artist's own hand making a signature gesture it is an incipient relic. The result is an absurd, self-contradictory object, so cannily self-aware of its own absurdity and self-contradictions that it might frustrate us until we are ready to threaten it with the kind of violence with which its creator once dropped, deliberately, an ancient Han Dynasty urn. In one shattering moment, creating an enduring and unendurable ambivalence. What did he mean by it? Why would he do such a thing? It is an open and unanswerable question, 
not entirely unanswerable, or I'd be out of a job, but never definitively so. My favorite article about Ai Weiwei calls him China's last communist. This epithet flies in the face of the image imposed on Ai by both the Western art world and the Chinese government, who both try to paint him as a champion of Western democratic and liberal ideas. But Ai Weiwei's father was Ai Qing, a poet and wholehearted <coughs> revolutionary in the early communist movement. And the article makes a compelling argument that Ai Weiwei's art might best be understood as a contemporary expression of the political ideas of the early communists, ideals that are intensely embarrassing for China's government today because they are so contrary to current practice. Ai Weiwei appears acutely aware of the unresolvable contradictions in his life as well as his work, a knot that only can be undone through violence, even if that violence manifests as a rhetorical act like the destruction of a 2,000-year-old urn, the way Zen koans often culminate with a dead cat or an unexpected blow. Perhaps this is why Ai keeps going back to China, where his global fame has not protected him from incarceration or even physical abuse. The author of this article asserts that, quote, Ai's political interventions are a specific interpretation of Maoist training in public criticism and a commitment to egalitarianism in opposition to hierarchical authority. He goes on to say that, while many have accused Ai of being an egomaniac, using his stature as a political dissident to sell his personality, I want to suggest that Ai's intensive focus on his own life produces the exact opposite effect. Ai is not selling his personality so much as he is exposing it to the expectation of violence. And state-sanctioned violence is what he has succeeded in provoking, such as when he was detained for 81 days in 2011 and subsequently released under closely monitored house arrest, a surveillance that he mocked by setting up live streaming webcams and inviting the art world to surveil him along with the authorities. Though Ai has since succeeded in leaving China, just a few months ago this year in August, his Beijing studio was demolished unexpectedly by the authorities. Ai Weiwei is a provocateur, yes, but not an idle one. The earliest annals of Chinese history are full of narratives extolling the honest courtiers who insisted on speaking truth to power, criticisms the emperor did not want to hear, and they usually paid a terrible price for their principles. It is a stubborn streak that the culture extols for its very rarity, the way Christian Europe venerated its martyrs, because how many of us wouldn't at least pretend to recant to avoid torture and execution? Ai's gesture is a rhetorical stance, like all gestures, and it has its own history. I am not sure how far back the history of this specific gesture extends in China. Like Ai himself, who spent many of his formative years as an artist in New York City, and who is better known abroad than at home, this piece is inherently global and hybrid. It is the irreducibility of Ai's works, the openness of the questions that they invite, that make Ai Weiwei a good artist in the contemporary rhetorical mode. And another way that this could be considered a good work of art. But even if Zen koans and contemporary art operate as analogous modes of rhetoric, as I have so improbably asserted, they are only successful in their work if they convey a kind of experience that is antithetical to verbal description, a little shock of suchness. Even in Zen, this often manifests through rudeness, obscenity, taboo behavior. This gesture is familiar to every one of us, commonplace even, but still unacceptable. I was a little nervous about unveiling it in such polite company. If I replicated this gesture right now with my hands, we would all feel a little uncomfortable, but for a moment, we would all be fully present. Sadly, I lack the boldness of a martyr or a contemporary artist. I have not been trained in the rhetorical mode of Zen, so I cannot offer you that glimpse of Satori. And I lack the faculty that Clive Bell termed aesthetic emotion, so I cannot tell you if this form is sufficient to inspire it. But as an art historian, I assert that there are many conversations that we could have about this absurd little object, and that's good enough for me. So what makes a work of art good, in my estimation? 
It is not an essential quality of the object, not an arbitrary opinion on the part of the observer, but rather the description of a healthy relationship between the two. Even more broadly, good works of art are those that can sustain such relationships, works that reward repeated inquiry, inspire discussions with others, and works that are sufficiently complex and open-ended that they are renewed rather than destroyed by recontextualization, as the social frameworks that they inhabit inevitably and continuously change. So is this actually good art? For all the time I've just spent trying to show you how it might be, the more I dwell on that question, the more it seems like another koan, to which my answer is, oh dear, I've gone way over time. <laughs> my inclination is to get up here and to just say, you know, I don't know, um, <laughs> and leave, and we'd probably all be better off for it. If you go back to the original flyer that, uh, well, first of all, Thank you, Dr. Clack, for having us here today. It's really incredible. I was looking around the room at like how many students are here, and that's just a remarkable testament to everything that we're doing here. The entire art department is here, which makes me super nervous for what I'm about to say, but <laughs> that's all right. Um, so thank you all for being here. Um, the flyer for this sort of, I wanted to position myself before I said anything, which is that if you look, what you have is two scholars and a guy who writes some stuff and I'm the guy who writes some stuff. Um, I'm not a scholar, you know. Um, uh, my background is in writing, I work as a writer, and I intend to not represent myself as a scholar here. So, but I was invited today to speak about um, what makes good art, and I'm glad that the college recognizes that writing, you know, and literature is art. Um, in hopes of positioning myself accurately, I thought I would read from someone else's work, which is always a good idea when you don't know the answer to a question. So uh, let's sit back and listen to the words of Joan Didion, which will surprise nobody who's heard me speak before that we're going to start with Didion. Didion, in this essay uh, she gave as a talk at Berkeley in 1978, it's called uh, Why I Write. And she's talking, she's you know answering the question much like I'm trying to do here today. She writes, during the years when I was an undergraduate at Berkeley, I tried with a kind of hopeless late adolescent energy to buy some temporary visa into the world of ideas, to forge for myself a mind that could deal with the abstract. In short, I tried to think. I failed. My intention veered inexorably back to the specific, to the tangible, to what was generally considered by everyone I knew then, and for that matter have known since, the peripheral. I would try to contemplate the Hegelian dialectic, and would find myself concentrating instead on a flowering pear tree outside my window and the particular way the petals fell on my floor. I would try to read linguistic theory and would find myself wondering instead if the lights were on in the Bevatron up the hill. When I say that I was wondering if the lights were on in the Bevatron, you might immediately suspect, if you traffic in, ideals, in ideas at all, that I was registering the Bevatron as a political symbol, thinking in shorthand about the military-industrial complex and its role in the university community, but you would be wrong. I was only wondering if the lights were on in the Bevatron and how they looked, a physical fact. I had trouble graduating from Berkeley, not because of this inability to deal with ideas. I was majoring in English, and I could locate the house and garden imagery and the portrait of a lady, as well as the next person. Imagery being, by definition, the kind of specific that got my attention but simply because I had neglected to take a course in Milton. For reasons which now sound Baroque, I needed a degree by the end of that summer, and the English department finally agreed if I would come down from Sacramento every Friday and talk about the cosmology of Paradise Lost to certify me proficient in Milton. I did this. Some Fridays I took the Greyhound bus. Other Fridays I caught the Southern Pacific city of San Francisco on the last leg of its transcontinental trip. I can no longer tell you whether Milton put the sun or the earth at the center of his universe in Paradise Lost, the central question of at least one century, and a topic about which I wrote 10,000 words that summer. But I can still recall the exact rancidity of the butter in the city of San Francisco's dining car, and the way the tinted windows on the Greyhound bus cast the oil refineries around Carcanez Straits into a grayed and obscurely sinister light. In short, my attention was always on the periphery and what I could see and taste and touch on the butter and the Greyhound bus, 
During those years, I was traveling on what I knew to be a very shaky passport, forged papers. I knew that I was no legitimate resident in any world of ideas. I knew I couldn't think. All I knew then was what I couldn't do. All I knew then was what I wasn't. And it took me some years to discover what I was, which was a writer. By which I mean not a good writer, and Didion here puts good in quotation marks, just germane to our conversation today. Or a bad writer, but simply a writer. A person whose most absorbed and passionate hours are spent arranging words on pieces of paper. Had my credentials been in order, I would never have become a writer. Had I been blessed with even limited access to my own mind, there would have been no reason to write. I write entirely to find out what I'm thinking, what I'm looking at, what I see and what I mean, what it means, what I want and what I fear. Why did the oil refineries around Carquinez Strait seem sinister to me in the summer of 1956? Why have the night lights and the Bevatron burned in my mind for 20 years? What is going on in these pictures in my mind? And so I wanted to read that to you, to sort of position to you um, that Didion's uh, sort of uh, position as a writer is one of discovery, right? And in the course of making her art, it's always an act of discovery. Um, Jessica and Nick have provided you with real thoughtful scholarship today. And what I'd like to do today instead is to talk to you about the 1996 film, The English Patient and Why It Sucks. Um, <clears throat> a couple months ago, an essay by the writer Sarah Miller published, was published on the, um, this like really obscure website, at least to me. It was called popular.com. And this essay started making the rounds. And I think the New Yorker linked to it. And all of my like smart academic friends uh, started linking to it. And it was showing up in my news feed. And I was told I needed to read it. And former students were sending it to me. And I thought, OK, let's read this article. Um, and in the article, uh, Miller writes about her career in 1996 as a movie reviewer for, quote, Philadelphia's second best of two alt-weeklies. Uh, she details her career making $125 per review to torch various movies of the period like Braveheart, Toy Story, and Swingers, and writing about those movies like she, uh, that she did like, like Train Spotting with Equal Honesty. The essay in its entirety is worth reading and is particularly germane to our conversation today. It charts her growth as a writer. She writes, each week that passed, I wrote something amazing and nothing happened. So I dug in and wrote harder. I thought I was trying to get somewhere. I thought there was somewhere to get. I had no idea that what I was experiencing was being a writer and that no matter what happened, good or bad, I would feel exactly the same way forever. <laughs> and I can uh, confirm that. In the essay, she positions herself as hungry, ambitious, and nakedly, nakedly and deeply desirous of a staff position at the Alt Weekly. So when the opportunity comes up to review a capital S serious film, she jumps at it, and an indomitable freelancer spirit first tells her editor the truth about why she's excited to see the film, which is that the actress Kristen Scott Thomas has some sort of great blonde dye job in the movie that she really wanted to see her hair, you know? And then the editor box, so she lies and tells the editor that she had read Michael Odanchi's novel, The English Patient, and loved it, and so she wanted to review the film, uh, which, in fact, she has not done. Uh, nevertheless, she gets the assignment, settles in to watch the film, and is abhorred at what she sees on the screen. And here we're going to cut to her wonderful prose. The movie seemed very clearly bad. Juliette Binoche tittered with rueful appreciation as her patients sexually harassed her, peeled a plum with her sexy teeth, and because what's hotter than an irrepressible spirit during war, tickled out Bach on a bomb-damaged grand piano. Meanwhile, Post Burns, Ralph Fiennes, po oh, well, Ralph Fiennes suffered a horrific accident. You know, that's too bad. In the movie, not in real life. Uh, Post Burns Fiennes refused to let his physical deterioration interfere with the compulsion to offer unsolicited literary advice, like... You have to read Kipling slowly. Your eye is too impatient. This particular gem was delivered to Kip, a Punjabi Sikh, played by Naveen Andrews, Saeed from Lost, who no doubt had waited his whole life for fines to coach him on this very topic. What happens next is predictable. Uh, Sarah Miller goes on to write what she says is the very best review of her life, the best thing that she's ever written. And her pen-educated editor, sends it back to her and said, there's no way I can run this. I'm not going to. I'm going to get someone serious to run this. So I'm reading this essay, and I want to pause here for a second 
and what immediately comes to mind is a like discussion of what makes good art, a very serious discussion of what makes good art. So let's watch this for a few minutes and then I'm gonna pick it back up. I have no idea what this is, and I don't endorse whatever product this is. I've been paid nothing. You know, I walked through this like seven times in my office, and not once was there an app. Here we go. essay is that this uh, woman, Sarah Miller, she decides that she can't deal with consequences of um, her editor not approving of her, and so she says, please give me a second chance, and she goes back and she rewrites the essay, and she write, rewrites it as like a capital S, serious person, and the essay runs, and she talks, she has this really moving scene where she talks about how every day that her, essay, or like her articles would come out in this all weekly, she had the same routine and she would go down and get like tea and a copy of the newspaper and she would sit and like laugh at her own jokes in this like narcissistic ritual, you know? And, but she's like open about it. But then she says when that essay came out, that review came out, she didn't do it. She never read that, uh, that review and she completely suffered in self-respect for the fact that she like 
wasn't telling the truth about how she felt about this movie, right? And what happens is really interesting in the essay, which is that she goes on to have this great career, and that was like the original sin upon which her career began to take off, you know? That she realized that you could make money just writing things that you didn't believe in. She, you know, has this great career, the career takes off, 2008 hits, you know, she buys a house, she makes all this money, 2008 hits, the economy collapse, collapses, and she realizes that now, you know, all the magazines cut her, she, she has no money and no self-respect, and it all, she traces it all back to this movie, The English Picture, right? <laughs> So, in a very similar way, like, what happens to Elaine is that the consequences of her taste run encounter to consensus, which is the thing that I'm actually going to talk about here for a second, uh, the idea of consensus, um, comes at enormous personal cost. She loses her friends, her romantic relationship, and then her job, and ultimately, in a scene that we don't uh, see here, ends up on a hijacked plane to Tunisia, right? Uh, and all of this with no prospects of ever seeing her beloved sack lunch, right? Uh, Miller, meanwhile, charts the downfall of her entire career to the English patient. The review that she wrote was the original sin, the taproot lie upon which a career of what she considers to be meaningless purple prose was born. What does any of this have to do with what makes good art? Um, not much, perhaps, other than that both examples give us a sense of the dangers of consensus in, in our critical in impulses. Consensus, of course, is often helpful and right, but it can just as often be a bludgeon that strips us of our individual taste. And, and what I'm really thinking about here is like criticism and reviews and like on what do we base our opinions. And all of that comes down to the idea of subjectivity. And you'll have to uh, forgive me because I've never used this slide in my life. Um, I did make one for class this morning, Grant. This is a good slide, right? Yeah. Um, how do I advance this? There should be a, another slide. Yeah, that's hand drawn, by the way, like an hour ago. I used a coaster to make those circles, and now it's gone, and that's that hurts. Um, all right, so uh, what I want to talk about is the idea of subjectivity, right? And I talk to my students about this a lot. Um, so. You know, Nick and Jessica have positioned all the sort of philosophical and historical arguments about what makes good art, but we all know what it's like to, to look at something and to say, hey, I like that, that's good, right? Why is it that when I was an undergraduate at the University of San Diego, however many years ago, 20 of them, and I sat in the back of Dr. Joe McGowan's Irish Traditions Literature class not reading the books on Irish tradition and instead was reading J.D. Salinger's Raise High the Roof Beam Carpenters, which no one's ever heard of, did I think that that was the best book that I had ever read at that time, right? This is a Venn diagram that was given to me uh, when I was hired to teach at the university. I asked the then and now department chair, Sister Mary Hudson, sitting right here. Wonderful person, the best person I've ever met in my life. Uh, uh, when there would be teacher training, because I had no idea what I was doing, and she said, if you have any questions, let me know. And I think the only question I've asked her was about this and how students derive meaning right from work. And she gave me this Venn diagram, which came from a pamphlet, I believe, you read, right? And, and this is the most useful thing that I, that I give to my students, right? How do we decide what makes good art, right? If, and, and, and I think it would be a cop out to say, well, it's subjective. I teach intro to creative writing, and when we get to our poetry unit, my students get super excited because they go, well, you know, po a poem can mean anything. And I'm like, no, it cannot. <laughs> so, what we have is the text, or in the case of Ai Weiwei, the matter itself, right? And I think as, as Doctor, uh, as, as uh, Nick and Jessica have, have already talked about today, like uh, the context within which that work is made can go a long way to the way that we uh, derive meaning out of it, right? But that third, Venn di third circle in the Venn diagram I think is super important, right? Um, why is it that two nights ago I was sitting with my children watching some movie called Wonder that is clearly like bad on its merits and I was like crying and I was like, this is a great movie, right? <laughs> because uh, it's the context within which I was experiencing that film, right? With my children, watching some extremely sentimental movie about the value of loving your children, right? And all this kind of stuff. So why is it that the book that I'm talking about, the Salinger book that I read when I was 20 years old meant so much to me? It's because of when I read it, right? 
this Venn diagram is super important, I think, to helping us understand why art matters to us and when it does, right? There's the art itself, there's the context in wi within which it was made, and then there's the context within which we experience it, right? Um, so I think, I don't wanna, we're kind of running out of time here, but um, what that leads us to is a, con uh, is a conversation about like consensus and the critical impulse. And I just wanna leave you with one last thing. Um, Dave Eggers is a writer who is now very famous, um, but in the year 2000, he was just this guy who had founded this magazine called Might, and he wasn't so famous, and he wrote a, a memoir called A Heartbreaking Work of Staggering Genius, which is like a fantastic title. And, um, and the book sold a lot of copies, and he went from this like underground guy making zines to a guy who had sold a couple million copies of his memoir. And it's like a really beautiful memoir, and I suggest if you haven't read it, to go ahead and read it. Um, it is heartbreaking, and, and you know there is some genius there. Well, this kid from the Harvard Advocate decides to like email some capital S serious questions to Dave Eggers, and this is his chance to sort of like take the wind out of Eggers a little bit. And so he's talking about criticism and the critical impulse or the critical uh, reception that the book has gotten. And Eggers' response is so beautiful, and it's the thing I'm going to leave you with here today. Eggers writes, "I think criticism more often than not completely misses the point. Yes, the critical impulse demonstrated by the tone of many of your own questions is to suspect, doubt, tear at, and to take something apart to see how it works, which is of course completely the wrong thing to do to art." I used to tear books apart and tear art exhibits apart. I was an art and book critic for a few years in San Francisco, but my urge to do that was born of bitterness and confusion and anger, not out of any real need to help or edify. When we pick at and tear into artistic output of whatever kind, we really have to examine our own motives for doing so. What is it about art that can make us so angry? Is it healthy to rip to shreds something created by an artist? I would posit, if I may, that that's not really a healthy impulse. Now, as far as I know, out of maybe 100 or so reviews that I've been made aware of, my own book has received only one negative example. That's pretty lucky, especially when you consider that David Foster Wallace, for example, has gotten pretty abused by some people, people who for the most part don't have the patience his work requires. But criticism for the most part comes from the opposite place that book enjoying should come from. To enjoy art, one needs time, patience, and a generous heart. And criticism is done, by and large, by impatient people who have axes to grind. The worst sort of critics are, analogy coming, butterfly collectors. They chase something, ostensibly out of their search for beauty, then once they get close, they catch that beautiful something, they kill it, they stick a pin through its abdomen, dissect it, and label it. The whole process, I find, is not a happy or healthy one. Someone with his or her own shit figured out with any emotional problems or bitterness or envy, instead of killing that which he loves, will simply let the goddamn butterfly fly, and instead of capturing and killing it and sticking it in a box, will simply point to it, hey everyone, look at this beautiful thing, hoping everyone else will see the beautiful thing he has seen. Just as no one wants to grow up to be an IRS agent, no one should want to grow up to maliciously dissect books. Are there fair and helpful book critics? Yes, absolutely, and of course. But by and large, the only book reviews that should be trusted are by those who have themselves written books. And the more successful and honored the writer, the less likely that writer is to demolish another writer, which is further proof that criticism comes down, comes from a dark and dank place. What kind of person seeks, seeks to bring down another? Doesn't a normal person, with his own life and goals and work to do, simply let other li others live? Yes, we all know that to be true. Um, and that's all I've got. I hope you got something out of that. Great. Oh, yeah, should we moderate? Yeah. Uh, I want to address this act in relation to Ai Weiwei. But, you know, traditionally we think of aesthetics, ethics as separate realms. But in a sense, they really are one realm. And Ai Weiwei did a wonderful thing bridging the two. Because if you go back to the Yuan dynasty, the literati abandoned the court, in a sense giving the Mongol court the finger. Right? <laughs> and, uh, but he also bridged it in the modern sense of this opening up the mysteries of existence by these unanswerable questions. 
doctor leaves it open, right? So in a sense, how that's connected to ethics is that that openness allow us to learn and make ju judgments that allow us to step forward. And I think that's a basis of ethics as well as aesthetic. Because, you know, if you are a sensitive individual in terms of aesthetic, presumably you are sensitive in terms of uh, ethical concerns as well. So I want you to make a comment about how he is able to bridge that gap between the traditional Chinese giving a finger to the Mongol court <laughs> and the contemporary context of opening up the intellect. Well, the first thing that you make me think of is comparing the Yuan Dynasty to what happened again in the Qing, the Ming Qing transition. And right after the Qing Dynasty um, came into power, there was a whole movement for ugly art. So maybe that's connected in the same way. Um, that in, I mean, I, I guess the same thing happened in the early 20th century in World War One. I, I mean, in ugly times, how can you have beautiful art? People start to it starts to feel unconvincing. So I mean, maybe that explains a lot of the 20th century's artistic output and why beauty is no longer fashionable. I'm not sure if that completely answers your question, but those are just the, the thoughts that it inspired. <laughs>